Did you ever stop to think about the relationship between a musical instrument and the particular kind of music that's played on that instrument? My suspicion is that the design of an instrument affects the music that comes out of that instrument far more than is often acknowledged. Like the actual physical way that the strings are arranged and the way that you play them with your fingers, the things that are easy, the things that are hard and the things that are impossible, all those physical things affect the kind of music that's played and that it makes sense to play on each instrument. To see what I mean, let's look at some examples of how instruments affect the music that's written for them from around the world. We'll look at a melodic line from West Africa, which was born out of an instrument with a very unusual arrangement of its strings. A harmony from southern Spain that would be impossible to imagine without the guitar. But to begin with, a rhythmic conundrum from Brazil. A quirky rhythm that probably emerged from the way certain percussion instruments are played. And this is an example of a classic samba rhythm. I've talked about this rhythm before on my video about microrhythm. The 16th notes that you hear in the samba are wonky, so that in every group of four 16th notes, the third and fourth notes are slightly rushed, slightly early. According to one study, they're played an average of 20 to 30 milliseconds before the beat. So why is that? Is that just a groove that people liked, or did it emerge out of the qualities of the instruments that played it? Well, I've got three different hypotheses for you, and the first was actually suggested by a viewer on that microrhythm video. Repenique players who lead in Batucada use one stick and one hand to play the drum. The stick plays the first three sixteenth notes with one bouncing stroke, and the other palm plays the fourth. Due to the bouncing stick, it's easy to give the first three notes a slight accelerando as the stick bounces closer to the skin with each bounce, which gives the rhythm its uneven swing. So that's one theory, and we'll see the other two in a moment. But for now, let's move on to an example of instrument design affecting melodic lines. And this is from West Africa. Found in countries like the Gambia, Guinea, Mali and Senegal, the kora has a really unusual layout of its strings. As an instrument, it's essentially the same concept as a harp. You have a bunch of strings, each string plays just one note, and all the strings are attached to a resonant box, or a gourd in this case, which amplifies the sound. The strings are arranged on two sides, one for each hand, and it's how these strings are tuned that's so fascinating. They're tuned in alternating thirds. You can see the right hand and left hand notes. All of these notes here and here are major or minor thirds. As you can imagine, this makes some things a lot easier and some things a lot harder. One of the things it makes much easier is to play neighbouring notes very fast. So that's a fairly typical example that moves up and down neighbouring notes like this. So Cora music is full of little ornamental runs like this because they're really easy to do and they sound great. something about this unusual layout of the chorus that really infiltrates the music that's played on it. If you ever get a chance to sit down and mess around with the chorus, you'll be amazed how it playing almost anything on it straight away starts to sound like chorus music. And I think that's entirely because of this unusual setup of the strings. So we've had one melodic example and one rhythmic example. Now let's see how the harmonic language of music can be affected by the layout of instruments. And this time we'll look at flamenco. With an instrument like the guitar that plays harmonies or chords, the connection between the design of the instrument and the music is a little more obvious. There are only certain shapes that the hand can play. But the instrument itself will also guide you towards chords you might not otherwise have used. So for the most part, flamenco is music that's built around standard major and minor chords. 
there are a bunch of chords that have a very characteristic flamenco sound that involve playing some of those standard chords along with open strings of the guitar. For example, the F chord of the classic Andalusian cadence often uses this chord with B and E at the top, which aren't part of the F major chord, but happen to be the top two open strings of the guitar. Here's another example, which is an F sharp major chord, but with, again, the top three open strings of the guitar on top. Or this one, which is a B flat major chord with two open strings of the guitar. Now I'm not saying that flamenco guitarists are lazy, but somewhere, somehow, someone played one of these chords, left those open strings ringing and thought, Sounds pretty sweet. Yeah, I guess it is. And my point is that these chords only came about because of the design of the guitar. They simply wouldn't have been discovered using another instrument. I don't know if you feel the same, but I find these things really fascinating, and I'll throw a bunch more examples I've thought of over the years at the very end of the video. But for now, let's think for a minute about <coughs> keys. Rush E is a piece of musical internet memory released on the YouTube channel Sheet Music Boss in 2018. It's MIDI generated and designed to be impossible for humans to play. The very predictable response was a rush of Rush E performance videos played on real world instruments. My favourite is probably this version played by recorder player Susie. Extreme virtuoso pieces like this are like test beds for instrument design. They show you very effectively what is easy and comfortable to play and what is a nightmare. And they highlight the way the instrument design affects the choices of key that best suit the instrument. Every instrument has keys that are easy and keys that are more challenging. Flamenco, for example, is usually played in E Phrygian, which sits comfortably on the guitar and takes advantage of its open strings. And it's a similar story in folk fiddle playing, which very often is in A or D for similar reasons. Virtuoso tricks like pedal point and bariolage use the open strings to bounce off and return to, and are much easier in these keys. Wind players tend to prefer keys with mostly white notes so that they can use the open holes rather than the more complicated fingerings of multiple sharps. So Rush E is actually in A minor, so it's mostly open notes and it works much more effectively on most instruments than if it was, say, Rush F sharp or Rush B flat. F sharp. And this gives us one of the general principles as to how instruments affect music. Players love things which are easy or at least comfortable to play, and perhaps most importantly that don't put them at risk of injury by forcing their hands into unnatural positions. So one of the main effects of instruments on music is to steer the music towards things that sit well on the instrument. Now as it happens, Rush E modulates in its closing passage to the five flats of B flat minor. And Susie does an excellent job of nailing it in this key, but you can definitely see that it's more of a struggle. Look at the fingering she has to do here, for example. If the whole piece was in this key, I'd be worried she'd be doing herself some kind of damage. So for composers, this is a good thing to be aware of, which keys are easy and which patterns are difficult, because that will affect the fluidity and the degree of tension and anxiety present in the performance. At the same time, the easiest tricks on the instrument often get overused and become cliches, so the challenge is to find a balance between music that's comfortable and music that's too comfortable. Don't get too comfortable. Okay. To give you an example from my own experience, a while back I was writing a piece for guitar and orchestra, which will finally premiere next year in London after some, you know, plague thing got in the way. Here, let me just tweak that a bit. Yeah, that's better. The sketches for the piece had some fairly simple chords, but whenever I tried to work them out on the guitar and find a position that had the sound I wanted, I kept hitting a brick wall. Everything just sounded overused. It's what my friend Tantacruel calls zombie chords, chords that had just been done to death and have no interest anymore. So after a while of struggling with this, I came up with a cheeky solution. It's what's called scordatura, which is retuning the guitar strings. I'd come across this piece by Carlo Dominiconi, played here by Milos. 
guitar here is tuned to D A D A D F. It's a quite a drastic retuning, and to me this piece had a freshness in its sound. Even though it's using a lot of fairly common chords, it just didn't sound the same as other guitar pieces. So I followed this example and retuned three of the strings on my piece, including the G up to an A. And what I found was this straightaway gave me a whole range of possibilities for shapes and positions and sounds that wouldn't have been available to a standard tuning. For example, when you have the A and the B next to each other, it's easy to play three notes like this. almost as a melody on three different strings, almost like a chora actually, where the sounds are able to ring on. It was amazing that just by retuning a couple of strings, the cliched sounds vanished, and I opened up a whole world of new possibilities. It's also, I have to admit, a fairly extreme example which won't be available in most situations. Now there's a couple more things to tell you about this relationship between music and instruments, but it's time now to check in on the second of our theories about that wonky Brazilian samba rhythm. This time the suspect is the pandeiro, the tambourine-like instrument that's used in a lot of samba. The hand holding the instrument tilts back and forth as it's played, and that might be what led to this wonky beat. Yep, also sounds convincing. And please can someone buy me a quicker? <coughs> Instrument design doesn't just affect what composers compose, it also affects how they compose. If you use an instrument to help you compose, the way that's set up will influence your compositions. One of my favourite composers, Stravinsky, openly acknowledged the importance of sitting at the piano on his writing. Many of his pieces, even for large ensemble or orchestra, started life in piano form and bear the influence of someone who wrote them at the piano. Fingers are not to be despised, he said. They are great inspirers and, in contact with a musical instrument, often give birth to subconscious ideas which might otherwise never come to life. Now take a look at a piano keyboard. Stravinsky was famous for writing some of the first polytonal music, music that's in two keys at once. And how do you think you could separate out a piano keyboard into two different keys? Stravinsky's famous Petrushka chord, and a lot of the music in the piece Petrushka itself, is centred around the combination of white note C major and black note F sharp major. So these first experiments with polytonality probably started with the composer at the piano testing stuff out. Many other 20th century composers, including Bartok and Ligeti, wrote polytonal pieces that seemed built around this black and white nature of the piano. It begs the thought, if the piano had been designed differently, would polytonal music ever have been discovered? How would music history have turned out if Stravinsky had had access to something like this Lumatone keyboard? Okay, back to the samba now, and the theory that I think most convincingly explains that wonky rhythm. And who better to explain it than Jacob Collier? So, this is how people normally shake. And that's good. But if you're going to shake uh, Brazilianly in, for like two or three hours, then this is not sustainable. So actually, if you halve the number of times your arm moves, and you move your wrist every other time, like this. Then you have samba. It's really simple. So that explanation is probably my personal favourite, but I don't think we can definitively say which of these options is correct. Whichever one it was though, the process was the same. It was almost certainly something that started subconsciously and only gradually became the defining feature of the style. The rhythm that we know as the backbone of Brazilian samba most likely came about because it was easier or more comfortable to play. Now to finish off, I'll leave you with a few more examples which didn't make it into the main part of the video of interesting instruments which I think have affected the music that was written for them. Thank you so much for watching and thanks to my patrons on Patreon for supporting the channel and I'll see you next time.
Thank you.